Thank you. All right. Hi, guys. My name is Christy Weiler, and I am a master's level uh, psychologist. I'm a therapist. I work at McCaskill Family Services. I work in the Plymouth office. We also have a Brighton office. Um, I work as the director of the Eating Disorder Recovery Program here. Um, I'm also a group therapist. I run IOP and outpatient levels of care. I do individual therapy, group therapy, um, family therapy, and I'm actually a graduate of the Wayne Westland Community Schools as well. Go Zebras. Um, I went to U of M and then I was um, a dance studio owner and teacher for about 13 years. I owned my own studio and I did that. And then after a while, I decided I wanted to go back to school and I got my uh, master's degree in psychology and I specialize in eating disorders. Um, and with those two things together, I love to uh, work with performers and athletes and working with eating disorders. I see a lot of anxiety, depression, self-esteem, um, communication and adjustment issues come up within that. Um, so on this slide, you see I have pictures of my family, some pictures of my team, some pictures of my fur babies. Um, things I like to do outside of this. I love to bake. I love to cheer on U of M football. And so today I am going to be talking about six different things. I'm usually a pretty informal presenter. So please, if you have questions, type them in the chat and we can either do them at the end or we can bring them up as they go. I think Jenny is going to be um, asking questions. So please um, put those in the chat if you have anything. I'm going to review what are eating disorders Will you notice the warning signs as a parent or a caregiver or a coach or a counselor as a loved one? What would each of those roles see? We're going to talk about what causes eating disorders. And if you do notice some of these warning signs, what can you do now if you see this in someone that you love or someone that you are um, coaching or teaching? I'm going to talk about if eating disorders can be prevented. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about some resources I have if you would like more information. So the very first thing we're going to talk about is what are eating disorders. I know when I was getting my license, this was not something we spent a lot of time on. Um, this is not something a lot of people have a lot of knowledge on. So I'm going to start at the beginning, but give, give kind of um, a high level overview of what they are. Before I talk about what they are, though, I'm going to talk about some things that they are not. There are a lot of myths around eating disorders just because we don't know um, as a general population, we don't tend to know a lot about them. So there tend to be a lot of myths about them. These are some myths that I hear a lot um, regarding eating disorders. Um, they are definitely not a female problem. They affect all genders. They are not caused by parents. In um, 30, 40 years ago, that actually was the way that uh, eating disorders were treated. They said this is caused by parents, mostly the mom, and then that was kind of how treatment progressed. But we know now they are not caused by parents. Uh, they're not easily noticeable. We talk about early and aggressive intervention for eating disorders, and we consider early intervention anything within the first two to three years because they are so secretive, it is very easy to not notice them. That's part of the reason I love to do outreach like this, because I think if I can get more eyes on um, these kids, I'm going to talk about kids today and teens today, eating disorders affect all genders and all ages. Um, but if we can get eyes early on it, we can treat it more effectively the earlier we can catch it. Eating disorders are just not about food. It's not just, hey, eat the sandwich or, you know, don't eat this. It's much more complicated than that. Eating disorders are not about gaining attention. And they're actually not only about a certain body type. Most people think about a smaller body when they think about eating disorders. And that's just not true. It's not just a phase. It's not just a choice. It's definitely not a teenage problem. And the one thing that we have seen again and again through research is this is not a life sentence, sentence which again was something that we used to think that once we had um, an eating disorder, maybe this was something that we are going to have to deal with forever. And we just have seen that that's not the case. They are highly treatable. One thing we definitely know about eating disorders is that they are not rare. They are highly underdiagnosed and therefore highly undertreated, but they are definitely not a rare disease. This was a graph that I pulled for a different presentation um, and eating disorders, of course, caught my eye on this. This huge spike, this top line, this dark green is COVID. 2020, that was a COVID pandemic. And so we saw if you're in the mental health industry or if you're just dealing with humans or adolescents in general, you probably saw the spike in anxiety and depression. Um, there was a spike in self-harm. Um, and eating disorders was something that really spiked at that time. So it had almost a 108% increase uh, from the time this graph started in 2018 until 2020. So these are the most recent numbers I have, but I can tell you from 
experience in working in eating disorders, this has not calmed back down. Eating disorders are still affecting a lot of um, people. And so what we do know about some numbers is that they affect 9% of the population. So that's about 28 million people. And again, eating disorders tend to be very underdiagnosed. So these numbers we think are actually lower than what the actual numbers are. But the research right now shows they affect about 9% of the population. They're the second most deadly mental illness, second only to opioids. And they tend to be misunderstood. And therefore, again, they're underdiagnosed and undertreated, which is why I love to do outreach like this and make sure that we can understand them better so we can catch them and we can treat them or do as much as we can to try to prevent them. Whenever I do a presentation on eating disorders, the day before, I love to just Google eating disorder images to see what comes up um, because I'm pretty sure I, I'll know what comes up. Usually for eating disorders, we think of a young, smaller body, uh, white woman. And that is also kind of the image that Google is pulling for us. Eating disorders, however, we know that they can affect any gender. They can affect any age. They also affect all racialized identities. Um, there's nothing that they discriminate against. So these other images that I have included, this is more what eating disorders actually look like. So one big thing that leads to them being underdiagnosed and not therefore undertreated is that we aren't looking for them. We're not screening for them. We're not keeping our eyes out for them in places where they are. So in, in older adults or in males or in people of all racialized identities, all different nationalities, they affect everyone. And some more numbers show that about 6%, so only 6% of people who have an eating disorder are considered underweight. So eating disorders affect all body types. You cannot tell who has an eating disorder by looking at them. That's another one of the big myths. Well, they look fine. They look healthy. They don't look too thin. That's, you know, that's 6% of the population that has an eating disorder. You're going to maybe notice that they are underweight. Men represent 25% of eating disorder diagnoses, and they are not usually screened for eating disorders. And 13% of women over 50 also report eating disorder symptoms. Like I said earlier, I feel like many of these numbers are underreported just because we are not um, screening as well for these different populations. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if these numbers were actually a little bit larger than that. As I go through this presentation today, I'm going to use a few different terms. And so I wanted to kind of give definitions for, for what it is that I'm, I'm speaking about. Restriction is the first thing that there are sometimes some myths or misconceptions about. A lot of eating disorders do have to do with restriction. And when I say restriction, or when we talk about restriction with eating disorders, it does not mean that there is no food being eaten. It does not mean that zero calories, zero energy, zero food is being consumed. That's, I don't know that I've ever seen that in treating eating disorders. Usually there is still something being consumed even in the restrictive eating disorders. What restriction means is that it's less than, it's not as large as it used to be. The volume is smaller. The variety is smaller. Maybe we've cut out food groups. Maybe we no longer eat meat or sugar or carbs or fat, or instead of eating three meals a day, we're eating two meals a day. Or instead of having a full dinner plate, now maybe it's a half dinner plate. So anytime there's any kind of restriction where food is limited or food is less than. Binging is another term that we'll hear as we're describing the different types of eating disorders. And a true clinical binge is a very vague definition. And they talk about a binge is when there's a feeling of a loss of control around eating. So you feel like you don't have control while you're eating. You're eating more than most in a certain amount of time. And you're eating usually until uncomfortably full or you feel ill. And this often happens alone. This is typically um, a secretive or a hidden activity. And a lot of times this is associated with guilt and shame. So the big things with a binge is that you feel that out of control feeling and there's guilt and there's shame associated with it. I'm going to talk about purging as well. With purging, I mean on intentional vomiting. So on purpose vomiting, using laxatives, using diuretics. Um, some people who are prescribed insulin will manipulate their insulin as a way of purging. Excessive exercise can be a way to purge and diet pills too. 
when I say excessive exercise, I was a dancer. I owned a dance studio. I was a dance teacher. I think movement is great. I like to go to the gym myself. I like to work out. I think exercise is really helpful. It's great for mental health. It's great for cardiovascular health. It has a lot of benefits. Excessive exercise is when we're talking about, is it compulsory or is it compensatory? So compulsory and compensatory means it's a very rigid and uh, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of guilt and shame associated with it. It's where you feel like you cannot miss. You have to do at least two hours of cardio or you have to get your YouTube exercise video in every single day. Or I can't eat that because I didn't exercise yet. Or I have to exercise because I just ate that. It's when you're connecting things of almost in a punitive way where exercise is going to be the fix or the punishment for what just happened, or you feel like you cannot step away from it. So it's getting in the way of maybe family events or work or social activities or school or just sleep mood. It's kind of getting in the way of other things. And that's where it's gone too far. One theory that my practice and most practices that treat eating disorders um, are based on is called set point theory. And set point theory is a new term for a lot of people. And set point theory means that our bodies are genetically predetermined to be within a certain weight range. And we typically do not give one number as this is what weight your body is supposed to be at or your body wants to be at. We say usually most bodies will have a range in which they find homeostasis and they are calm and things are working as effectively and as efficiently as they can. And so some people, maybe their set point range is, you know, 200 to 215. And within that range is kind of where their body feels comfortable. That's where it's supposed to be. The same as our um, height or our shoe size is genetically predetermined. Our body kind of knows where that is supposed to be. Our body also knows what size it is supposed to be. And there is no right or wrong weight or size or body shape to have. And so set point says that our body is going to work to keep itself there. A lot of people maybe who have done uh, chronic dieting and they've dieted and plateaued and the weight came back and dieted, maybe plateaued and the weight came back. They're feeling their body's push to keep you in that set point because that's where your body feels safe. Um, and the next thing on here is IWL, that's short for intentional weight loss. That's any time that anyone is on purpose trying to change the size or the shape of their body. Jenny, do I have any questions on any of this stuff? So, so far, am I good to go? You are good to go. <clears throat> Pardon me. You are good to go. Okay. So I'm going to talk about eight different types of feeding and eating disorders. I'm not going to talk about eight. There are eight. I'm going to talk about five of them. So there's eight types of feeding and eating disorders. Most people have maybe heard of one, maybe two or three. So these are the eight types. There's anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which we shortened to ARFID because that is a mouthful to say, pica, rumination, other specified, which we'll say OSFED, and unspecified. So I'm going to talk about just the most common five that we see. Anorexia nervosa, which I'm just going to say anorexia. I'm just going to say bulimia. Binge eating disorder or bad. ARFID and OSFED. The first two I want to go over are anorexia and ARFID. These are two uh, where restriction is the major part of the disorder. And so remember, restriction doesn't mean there's no food being consumed. There's not no energy, no calories being consumed. There's usually something being consumed, but it is a restricted amount or a restricted variety. So with anorexia and with ARFID, there's that restriction in energy, calories, food, resulting in a loss of weight, a low body weight, um, children or teens not growing as we're expected. There's some result in the body where this is not what we expect. Sometimes there's nutritional deficiencies. Um, and with the difference between anorexia and ARFID is anorexia. There's usually that really uh, large, intense fear of being fat or of being unhealthy or more now instead of fat, I hear more like toned or muscular. And so it's a lot of body image concern with anorexia. Where with ARFID, there's not necessarily the body image component. There may be some body image components there, but that's not usually the main part of ARFID. ARFID is when you think of those picky eaters or those selective eaters, and maybe there's a lot of different types of food that are being restricted. 
And this can be due to a number of reasons. So for some people, this is because of sensory issues where it feels too much or it tastes too much or it feels a certain way. Or, <laughs> excuse me, some people just have a lack of appetite or a lack of interest in food and food just doesn't feel like something they really, it feels like a chore. It's not something they really enjoy. It's not something they really want to like actively partake in. And some ARFID um, clients will have what we call a food trauma happen. So maybe they choked on something or they got sick after they ate something. And so now there's fear associated with a certain type of food or with food in general. So that's usually what we see with ARFID where it's more, I'm not interested in eating. Food is too sensory um, or too, too high of a sensory experience for me, or there's some kind of fear or avoidance around food. With binge eating and bulimia, these are the two disorders that have binge eating um, episodes that happen. So technically with binge eating, there's that lack of control around eating, a lot of guilt and a lot of shame that's happening. And then there's no what we call compensatory behaviors. So there's no maybe exercise or vomiting or use of laxatives after. If there's the compensatory things after the binge episode happens or in relation to a binge episode happening, that's where we will call it bulimia. The most common thing that people think of with bulimia is having that binge and then having an intentional vomiting episode or throwing up after. And then OSFID is one that I really want to talk about in relation to athletes. OSFID is kind of a catch-all diagnosis. This is actually the most commonly diagnosed eating disorder of all eight eating disorders. OSFED is the largest. And so this is where we say maybe the symptoms are subclinical. So maybe you're not hitting all of the criteria for something like ARFID or anorexia or bul <coughs> bulimia or PICA, but there's definitely disordered eating and or disordered exercise happening. So we would call this OSFED and we would treat it the same. This is also where maybe some terms that people have heard, things like orthorexia, people have usually heard of orthorexia, and that is a really large focus on eating what they consider healthy to them. So maybe that's a vegan diet or that's no carbs or that's no fat. It's whatever they feel for themselves is a really healthy diet. And, we, and it's to an extent where it's so rigid and so extreme that it is no longer overall healthy typically. And so that's called orthorexia. Diabulimia is when we're manipulating insulin um, to change body shape or size. Atypical anorexia is for someone who typically lives in a larger body and they have all the symptoms of anorexia, but they just happen to have started in a larger body where anorexia has certain BMI standards that are controversial that are attached to that diagnosis. So if someone were to start in a larger body and they have all the signs and symptoms of anorexia and they still have the malnutrition and they still have all the effects of that um, starvation syndrome, then this would technically be atypical anorexia and it's considered OSFED. The big one we're going to talk about today is called red S or REDS. And this is something that affects a lot of athletes. And sometimes it's referred to as like um, accidental anorexia. And it's not typically associated with someone who wants to change their size and shape. It just so happens that their energy in and energy out, the balance is off. It stands for relative energy deficiency in sport. So red S or reds. So for reds, we know for athletes, obviously all humans need food and drink. That's what we fuel on. Athletes especially need a ton of fuel. And enough is the healthiest thing that we can do, especially athletes. So we talk about, I'm part of a multidisciplinary team. So I'm a therapist. I work with a nurse and I work with a dietitian. So we're called a multidisciplinary team. So the dietitian will always focus on making sure you are getting enough of no matter what that food is, make sure you're getting enough, that you're getting some kind of breakfast, some kind of lunch, some kind of dinner, ideally two to three snacks throughout the day, and you're having enough to eat. Athletes are using so much energy, especially like our cross-country athletes, um, wrestlers, of course, dehydration is something we worry about, um, soccer where they're running so much, football where they're doing doubles or two-a-days, they're training so intensely, um, we have to make sure they're getting enough hydration, but also enough to eat.
So gentle nutrition is something we say that comes later. First, we have to make sure they're getting enough. If I can stress that enough today, that's my biggest message. Getting enough is the healthiest thing you can do for your body. And then your body likes to get a mix of foods. So when we're cutting out fats or we're cutting out carbs, our body needs those things. Most bodies need those things to be able to fuel, especially carbohydrates for athletes. They especially need carbohydrates. So pasta and grapes and brownies, salad, orange juice, hummus, like all of these things are wonderful. The more variety, the better. Yes, getting in fruits and vegetables, but also getting in carbs and fats and proteins and hydration. All of these things are necessary. And on top of that, of course, hydration, hydration, hydration. So we recommend for just the typical person, three meals and two to three snacks every day. For our athletes, sometimes we say they need second lunch. They need second breakfast. They need two dinners. They need a fourth snack. They need a fifth snack. They need a post-workout fueling snack. They typically need more than that. And their portions may have to be larger. So bodies typically like to eat every three to four hours. And that helps keep um, blood sugar stable and it helps the body know that food is coming on a regular basis. And we're just trying to keep body stress as low as possible. So it knows fuel is coming. It can build its reserves. It can do what it needs to do most efficiently. So every three to four hours means that yes, high school kids need to be eating breakfast. I hear all the time. I don't feel like eating when I wake up. I don't like breakfast. My stomach hurts if I eat in the morning. And then I hear a ton of high school kids, some middle school kids, I don't eat lunch. No one eats lunch anymore. No one eat bre eats breakfast anymore, or I can't eat snacks during the day. I can't eat snacks in school. So if they're waking up at 530 and then they're not eating anything till maybe they're home at 230 or three, that's too long that their bodies have gone without fuel. Their growing bodies have gone without fuel. And then if they're going to a practice right after school, even if they did do breakfast and they did do lunch, they have to make sure they're getting that pre-workout or that after school snack or that second lunch or whatever it is in there. You have to make sure that they are able to eat every three to four hours while they're awake. And sometimes that means an after dinner snack or a second dinner or something else. If they're staying up late in the night to do homework or if they had an early dinner, we have to make sure that they're getting enough. So when you don't get enough, this is for everyone, this is for athletes as well. When we don't get enough fuel, kilocalories, calories, food, fuel, kind of using those interchangeably, all of us might notice that we're not feeling so strong, right? Like if you're not fueled or you're not eating, you may not feel so great. Some people will feel out of breath. You may notice you're kind of getting hurt or you're kind of being clumsy. You're feeling a little bit extra tired. For some people, hunger cues are like getting a headache or getting tired one for a lot of people is getting hangry. Hangry is a real thing. Like your mood will change if your body does not have the fuel it needs. If you don't get enough fuel on a regular basis for a long period of time, that's when we start to step into the red S area or the reds area. So this may be that your athletes are not getting enough fuel or your athletes are burning so much that they're just not able to replenish. And maybe their hunger cues are not being recognized as readily or as intensely as they need to be to replenish what they need from after working out or before working out. So if we have this happen for a long time, and again, RADS is usually called accidental anorexia. People typically are not trying to do this. It just happens. The results are the same as anorexia, though. The things that happen in anorexia happen in red S as well. Whether you did it on purpose or not, your body doesn't know, but the results are the same. So in anorexia or in red S or in ARFID, we see things like irregular period for those who menstruate or low testosterone levels. Your body will go back to pre-puberty levels of hormones because it knows that I cannot, like, bear to have a child right now. I should not be reproducing right now. I need to take care of myself. This is not something I need to be worrying about. When I was young, I was told not having a period was a super normal thing for athletes. That's just what happens. And I've learned that is not what just happens. If someone who is menstruating all of a sudden has spotty periods or does not have a period any longer, that's something that needs to be checked out. And sometimes it is because you're not fueling enough and your body almost just like shuts that system off and it's, you know, okay, we can't handle this anymore. This is not um, what we can do right now. We don't have enough energy for this right now. We don't have enough energy to produce these hormones to have this going. Sometimes it's something else, but if that's ever happening to an athlete or anyone that you know, it usually means something is going on. It's not a normal thing. 
unstable heart rate and blood pressure is something else that we see. And that can be really scary for athletes. If we see things like heart palpitations, chest pain, getting dizzy, fainting, um, this really scares us for our swimmers. If you faint in the pool, that's a really scary thing. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone, every athlete is definitely getting enough. So we're not seeing any of these unstable heart rate or blood pressure issues. A lot of our clients, especially our athlete clients will go to a medical professional and they will be told your heart rate is low. That's great. That's because you're an athlete. You are in such great shape. Good job. Wish my heart rate was that low too. And it's not always that a lot of times it's because your body is malnourished and your heart is weak and your blood pressure is low and your heart is not beating as efficiently or as much as it should be. So one great test for that, we ask for an orthostatic taking of uh, vitals. And so someone will maybe sit down for a few minutes, they'll let their heart, uh, heart rate slow down and rest. And then once you're rested, you stand up and you see what that heart rate does. Because an athlete's heart, if it's truly a condition, Olympic caliber athlete's heart, that heart can take that change and it can stand up no problem. But a heart that is weaker or a heart that's not getting the nutrition it needs, that heart rate's going to plummet or going to skyrocket. Or if you go from lying down to sitting up and you're kind of seeing spots or your heart rate really starts to go really fast, that's how we know that maybe that's not an athlete's heart. Um, that's we need more fuel. We also see decreased immune function where people are getting sick more or they're staying sick longer. Um, your body will start to take energy from wherever it can, and it cannot resupply the material it needs to keep those bones dense. And especially for our kids, this is the time of life where bones are supposed to be gathering all the calcium for, for what they need for the rest of their lives. And so if you see kids that continue to get kind of the same frequent injuries, I see a lot of ankles and backs, a lot of backs in gymnasts because the bones are literally not as dense as they need to be to support what they're doing because they aren't able, they're not getting enough fuel or they're spending too much fuel and their bones can't do what they need to do. So if you see any frequent injuries again and again, it may be more than just, oh, this is the muscle we need to strengthen. And maybe this is fuel that we need to increase. Um, any impaired growth or development, we always say a kid that's not growing as we would expect them to be, or a kid that's losing weight isn't typical. We want to make sure that, you know, everything is okay. Whenever your body is under your set point, I shouldn't say whenever, for most people, when your body is under that set point and your set point changes your whole life. So your body knows what it wants to be when it's six and when it's 12 and when it's 18 and when it's 25 and when it's 40 and 52. And so anytime we're under our set point, our metabolism is going to decrease to help us. Our anxiety is going to go up. Depression is going to go up and irritability typically goes up. And usually people are uh, experiencing bra brain fog. Concentration is off. Um, they're not responding as well to training. Maybe homework is um, starting to look a little more difficult. Their endurance is like tanking or not increasing as you would expect. And also strength is um, not what you'd expect anymore. Do I have any questions on this? I feel like this is a lot to kind of take in all at once. So there's, there's one question about if you think your child or a child that you know may have an eating disorder, mm -hmm. is the first step a doctor or yes. a mental health person? What is that first step? I would talk to their pediatrician or their primary care provider, whoever it is that you're seeing. Um, looking at growth charts is usually a pretty good indicator. So a lot of systems, medical systems, they plot on the same chart from the time the kid is little until now, even if it's between different systems, sometimes they'll integrate that information. And so you'll see my kid is plotting along on the 95th percentile. There's no right or wrong percentile. It's just your set point. It's just your percentile plotting along on the 95th percentile. And maybe we see a drop to the 75th and we're like, that's, hmm, that means something because your body looks like it wants to be on the 95th and something is suppressing it. Or you're a 20th percentile kid and you're plotting along and then you drop to the fifth. And it's like, oh, okay, it looks like your body wants to be 20th percentile. And now we're down on the fifth. So the growth chart would be a big one. Um, if a kid has blood work done and you see that there's any kind of vitamin or mineral deficiencies or anemia or things like that, that you wouldn't expect to see that's something else. So yeah, first step is a doctor's appointment. Um, another question, and this may, Christy, this may be something that is in your presentation still, and you may cover it. And if so, yeah. it's fine. But if, again, if there is a child who you suspect may have an eating disorder, isn't it true that 
they're not purposely doing it. They mm -hmm. may not realize it. So mm -hmm. do you approach that with the child? Do you approach it with the parent? What is the best way to kind of break the ice on that? For a coach or like a counselor? Correct. Or a teacher? Correct. Yeah. It would depend on the relationship. And I would say the age of the child, if this were like 12 and under, that's definitely, I feel like a parent conversation. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, and if it's someone that you have, you know, like an athlete that you have a great rapport with or a student that you have a great rapport with, you have a great relationship with them. And that's something you can talk about. I have some tips for later on of maybe just some like prompting questions of just staying curious and try to see what's going on. Okay. So, that's it for okay. now for questions. Yeah. Okay. So red S or reds used to be called the female athlete triad. And that sounds more familiar for some people. And that was saying there's reduced bone density, there's menstrual disorders, and there's low energy availability. So that means that there's an imbalance in what you're taking in or what your body has stored for availability versus what you're asking from your body on a regular basis. And then they're like, wait a minute, this can happen for more than just females. And then they also saw that, oh my gosh, this actually affects a lot of different aspects. So these are all of the different aspects of what happens in REDS. And this is when, again, it's not necessarily on purpose that the kiddo is trying to stay underweight or under what they their set point is. It's just, they're not fueling themselves enough to do what they need to do, to do what is asked of them. So as well as reduced bone density, menstrual or testosterone issues. There's also GI or gastrointestinal disorders. So this is going to be things like the kid feels bloated or they have what's called early satiety, which means they feel full from eating just like a small amount. So maybe they eat like half of a pizza, half of a piece of pizza. And they're like, oh my gosh, I feel so full where usually they were like three pieces or they're eating half of a sandwich or they just have goldfish for lunch. And they're like, oh my gosh, I feel so full because everything has been slowing down because their metabolism is slowing down. Their GI is slowing down just because they're not getting enough fuel and the body's trying to preserve itself. Um, like we said, depression can happen. Endocrine disorders, metabolic disorders happen. Anemia is common. Cognitive deficits, just because you don't have the energy to be fueling the brain as needed. Um, infections, reduced performance, increased risk of injury, cardiovascular disorders, just because that heart is not as strong as it needs to be. So a lot of not great things are happening, which coaches and counselors at school and staff at school is in a really wonderful place to be looking at the kids in a different way, in a different environment than maybe what parents are seeing. So that's a great time for a conversation of, oh, I noticed that like we keep having this nagging recurring injury. What do you think is going on? Or they said they were really out of breath today and we were doing something that, you know, wasn't too, too strenuous or before they've not had a problem doing that. So if you're seeing some of these things, making sure parents know what you're seeing. So the next thing is, will I notice the warning sign? So all this stuff seems really scary. Chrissy says it's super common. It's really scary. Will I even notice what's happening? So we want to look for the three big changes of mood and behavior and physical. So what is changing? I'm going to say kids, but again, eating disorders affect everyone, but I'm going to kind of focus this on like teenage high school athletes. So mood wise, like we said, anxiety, depression, irritability, usually increase hangry is real. And when you're constantly under fueled, your body is at stress or is stressed in your body is stressed, your brain and your body are stressed. And so those things definitely go up. You may see a kid who's usually quite pleasant or quite, quite compliant. All of a sudden they're really angry. Um, maybe there's stress around like team dinners or lunches. Things just feel a little bit off. There might be guilt or shame that they say, or, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have eaten that. Or I'm going to run an extra mile because I just ate that. Sometimes difficulty concentrating, you'll see where they can't maybe um, pick up training exercises or combos that you're trying to give them. And one thing that happens in mood when we are under fueled, our beautiful body tries to help us so much, it will laser focus our brain on food. So if your body knows you are under your set point on a regular basis, this is not where things feel great. It's like all hands on deck, make them concentrate on food. So, so many clients will come into me and they will say, all she's doing is like baking all the time, not eating it, but baking all the time and like wanting other people to eat it. Or he is so into the food network right now, or he's looking through food magazines, or she's finding recipes on Pinterest all the time because your brain makes you laser focus on food because it knows, hey, we need food. There must be a famine. We've got to find food. 
And a lot of people who are close to kids will just say when we're under that set point, no matter the eating disorder, or just when we're in those behaviors, again, no matter the eating disorder, they'll say they lost their spark. It just doesn't feel like them anymore. An eating disorder is so insidious. It's so overwhelming. And it kind of, it's like a tumor or like an alien that takes a person over and you do, you, if your anxiety and your depression and your irritability and your anger has increased and you just don't feel great and your GI is slowed down and you're tired and you can't focus, you, you just don't feel like yourself anymore. So those are some mood changes you would see. Behavior changes. Isolation is a big one in social withdrawal. So if you have, like I said, team dinners and someone is maybe like, oh, I'm just going to eat at home or, oh, I already ate or no, thanks. Maybe that food does not feel safe to them. Maybe they're restricting the type of food. They're restricting the amount of food. Um, maybe they're just nervous eating in, in front of people. And so if that's something that has not been an issue and all of a sudden that's something that's an issue, I would take notice of that. Refusing to go out to get, you know, like ice cream after practice, or we're all going to go to Red Robin and maybe not going on those trips or having an excuse or not really ordering anything during those um, sleep changes are big, really for anything. Sleep changes are going to be big. If they're not falling asleep, they're not staying asleep. They're saying to you, they're really tired or they're just not getting enough sleep. They can't seem to get enough sleep. Um, eating disorders tend to be very secretive. Reds is, I would say that's not typically too secretive because that is almost subconsciously that's happening. And that's just more of like education and focus. And we just need to make sure you're getting enough to eat. Other eating disorders tend to be very secretive. And so you might notice um, like hidden wrappers or things in a backpack or parents might notice things in the bedroom or like hiding wrappers in the trash or throwing food out. Or you might see like a whole lunch in the trash can at school. Um, so a lot of hiding and excuses. Um, if a kid is constantly going to the bathroom, maybe they have a nervous bladder, maybe something else is going on. If anyone is tracking movement on an app or on their watch and they seem really rigid, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Plenty of people do that and they don't have eating disorders. But if you have the vulnerability for an eating disorder and then you start that, that can be a really dangerous trend to get into. Or if you assign them, you know, this is how many miles I expect you to run in a week. And they're saying, oh my gosh, I ran like so many more. I did this on top of this or I need you to do, you know, weight training outside of practice twice a week. And they're like, I'm going every single day. I go before school, anything that feels new and different and intense and very rigid, rigid is what we're looking for. The biggest thing when looking back, parents say the biggest thing they noticed that was a warning sign they didn't know was a warning sign is when a kid said they're going to switch to healthier eating. And so sometimes this, I'm going to cut out sugar. I'm going to cut out fat. I'm going to cut out carbs. I don't do dessert anymore. I don't do that kind of food. I don't want Halloween candy. Anytime they say I'm going to switch to healthier eating, nothing inherently wrong with that. We all want to make sure we're healthy and getting what we need. But there's something about that for some kids where that was a really big warning sign for parents. So anytime they're restricting any type of food groups. And then physical changes. If you see any weight changes, kids and teens should be growing. We should grow into our 20s and well past our 20s. And our bodies continue to grow and change our entire life. Many teenagers do not know that they think that once your height is done, so maybe 12 or 14 or 16, and you're done growing vertically, they think your body doesn't change anymore. You're supposed to stay at that weight. And that's just not true. You are supposed to be growing and filling in your entire life. So like I said earlier, anytime a kid, what we call falls off their growth chart or their growth trajectory, they're either losing weight or they're not growing as we expected them to grow. Because it doesn't only change the weight of your body. Sometimes an eating disorder or not fueling enough can change your height as well. So maybe height has been stagnant for a while, or maybe they're the shortest in the group and they've been the shortest in the group. And now the group has all grown and they're still at that same height. Anything where it seems like they're off their growth trajectory um, or losing weight. Again, we talked about different um, changes in periods, feeling dizzy or fainting. If a kid faints or is dizzy, hopefully that is you know, taken very seriously. Heart palpitations taken very seriously. Kids that are constipated or bloated or having that GI discomfort, feeling uncomfortable after eating. These are some changes that we would see. If you ever see um, really dark circles or broken, bl broken blood vessels, I feel like I'm getting all tongue twisted, broken blood vessels around your eyes. 
that can be a sign of just not getting enough um, nutrition, not getting enough sleep, or those blood vessels can be from vomiting. Um, blood work is one of the first things that I ask parents to do. So we do evaluations for eating disorders. They come in and they talk to our staff. And then the first thing they have to do is go to the doctors and get their blood work done. And we tell them all the blood work we need. And then we review all that blood work. We want to see what's happening. Sometimes an EKG is necessary. So we want to see what's happening with an EKG with blood work. For some people with an eating disorder, if they get really far under their set point, they will start to lose their hair or their nails may start to um, break or crack or their skin gets very dry. But for some people who lose a lot of weight or under their weight, they start to grow what's called lanugo hair. And that's fuzzy, fine hair that is on us like as a fetus and as an infant to help keep us warm. So any sign of that kind of hair, I'm touching my shoulders and back because usually it comes on shoulders and backs. So any sign of that kind of um, hair growth is a really, a really big warning sign. And again, that frequent injury, if you have an athlete or you have a student that continues to have the same injury, same nagging ankle sprain, that same back injury, you know, I'd want to know what's going on. We would sometimes recommend what's called a DEXA scan, and that tells us how dense their bones are and where their bones are supposed to be versus where they um, are right now. Um, but that is something they'd be told at the doctors or at an eating disorder eval. So now that I've given you all these things that happen, I've told you how uh, not common, but not rare eating disorders are. You might want to know what causes this, and there's no good answer. Eating disorders are called a biosocial psychosocial psychiatric illness. And so that means your genes play a part. The brain chemistry you are given genetically plays a part. Your personality and the environment that you grow up in and that you are in most of the time affects all of this. So you could have a genetic vulnerability for an eating disorder or some kind of addiction disorder that is um, passed down generation to generation. You could have brain chemistry that makes you maybe really rigid or makes you really impulsive. And sometimes that can lead into eating disorder behaviors, sometimes personality traits like being a perfectionist um, or just having like really big emotions or having a lot of sensory um, sensitivities. And sometimes we grow up, we all grow up in diet culture. Diet culture is everywhere. And by diet culture, I mean um, things that are talking about weight loss or ideal bodies, or here's what it takes to be you know, physically appealing. Kids especially are getting those messages all the time. And so what kind of environment are you growing up in? What messages we talk about? What kind of messages are you hearing? What is being told to you subconsciously or just directly? You know, what is important about you? What is important about the way you look? What makes you valuable? And so the best thing we can do for eating disorders is to recognize the, fa the risk factors that are inherent, and then try to decrease those risk factors. So I cannot dis decrease your genetics or your brain chemistry. I can help with personality, um, things to make us aware and work on that. And then we can work on the environment as much as possible. But the risk factors are there. That doesn't mean that causes an eating disorder. We just know that that's there. And so this study that I like goes over the biological, psychosocial, psychological and behavioral factors. And I like this quote that says the etiology of eating disorders is complex. No single risk factor accounts for their manifestation. Rather prevalence is hypothesized to be a result of numerous factors. This is a fancy way to say they're very complicated. They're very complicated disorders. There's not one thing. It's not, oh, because your mom said this when you were growing up, you have an eating disorder or because your uncle had an eating disorder, you have an eating disorder. They're very complicated. So the best thing we can do is recognize um, risk factors and try to decrease them as much as we can. Some body image risk factors that we know to be true through research that makes me sad when I read through them each time is that by age six, girls especially start to express concerns about weight or shape. And they, so this is first grade, kindergarten, first grade girls are worried about how big they are, how small they are, if they're too fat, what their tummies look like. Those are babies. And then this trend continues to increase as girls age. So 40 to 60% of elementary school girls are concerned about their weight or becoming too fat. And then that number goes to 50% of 13 year old girls. So that's like seventh grade middle school girls. Uh, half of middle school girls are unhappy with their body. And body image usually has nothing to do with your body type. Body image does not discriminate. So people in a small body, an average size body, a medium body, a larger body, a tall body, a short body, body image doesn't care. And then that number of people unhappy of girls unhappy with their body grows to 80% by the time they're in high school. 
So high school girls, 80% of them are unhappy with their body in some way. So we already know that's a risk factor, body image and the messages that they get and the messages that they're telling themselves is a really big risk factor. And then for males, we know that 25% of them, so a quarter of males perceive themselves to be underweight. There is a stereotype in eating disorders that girls want to lose weight to be small and boys want to gain muscle to be big. That does trend, but that's not always. Some boys also, some males also want to be smaller and some girls also want to be larger, but that is kind of the trend that we see. And this says that 90% of teen boys exercise with the goal of bulking up. And this continues into young adulthood. So 90% of teen boys, that's the one reason that they're working out is to bulk up. And comorbidities are things that happen together. So disorders that kind of happen at the same time or sim simultaneously. And so this study showed that two thirds of people with anorexia also had anxiety. That does not mean that anxiety call causes anorexia, but that means that if you have that brain chemistry and those personality traits, or maybe that messaging, there's some things that are happening. We know that that is highly, highly comorbid with an eating disorder of anorexia. And then ARFID, which is where there's sensory issues or a lack of interest in food, or there was trauma around food. We know that ARFID is associated with anxiety. Usually there's anxiety around eating or anxiety around food, not typically anxiety around body size or shape, but anxiety around the food. And we know that that is seen a lot with OCD, with autism spectrum disorder, and with ADHD. So we see a lot of crossover of kids with ADHD are also struggling with eating issues or kids with autism are also struggling with eating issues. Maybe not on purpose trying to change their size and shape, maybe not on purpose trying to help regulate emotions through food, but they are just not interested in food. They're anxious around food. It doesn't interest them or something happened that gives them a lot of anxiety. So in one study, this showed that 33% of kids with ARFID had a mood disorder and 75% had anxiety disorder and 20% had ASD or an autism spectrum disorder. So we're seeing all of these things that are playing together. Again, these things don't cause eating disorders, but we see if they're there, there's kind of an increased uh, correlation to these being together. And then this is, this is the big one for us today that among female high school athletes and what's called aesthetic sports. So that's usually like dance, gymnastics, wrestling, rowing, swimming, diving, kind of anything that's like very body focus and how your body looks. Almost 42% report disordered eating. And remember, these things are typically underreported. And this is showing a huge, huge portion of female athletes are showing disordered eating. And that same group is eight times more likely to incur an injury. Because remember, if you're not fueling enough, you're not fueling on a regular basis, we haven't stabilized eating, we haven't stabilized the body and the mind, then injuries and low bone density and um, uh, coordination and concentration, brain fog, all of these things are going on at the same time. So they're more likely to be injured and we don't need our athletes getting injured constantly again and again. With binge eating disorder, we know sometimes that's linked to food insecurity. So maybe um, individuals or families who have not always felt that the next meal is secure for them, or they don't always know where their next meal or the next week of meals is going to come from, or they don't have available food around them. That is sometimes linked to binge eating because the body realizes that food is not always just available for me. So when there is food available, I have to make sure I get a lot of it because it's not always available to me. And PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, that's when something traumatic happens. Binge eating is commonly associated with that. Again, PTSD and a trauma does not cause binge eating, but we see those things kind of linked together. And bed is not talked about. There's a lot of stigma around that. Binge eating disorder happens in all body sizes and shapes. Usually we think of this kind of eating disorder is, you know, for a larger body and this kind of eating disorder is for a smaller body. And that's just not true. Those are things that get in the way of us properly diagnosing and screening for and helping people that need help. And what we know is that binge eating disorder is three times more common than anorexia and bulimia combined. But anorexia and bulimia are usually the eating disorders that people have heard of. But we know that binge eating is a really big problem that not a lot of people are talking about or screening for. We also know that BIPOC individuals are less likely, significantly less likely to even have been asked about eating disorder symptoms. So this is maybe through a coach or a counselor or a therapist or a dietitian or a medical professional usually is what they're talking about. 
that we think this is like a white disease. It's not. It is all racialized identities. It's all socioeconomic statuses. It is all ages. It is all genders. It is all body sizes and shapes. There is no one way to have an eating disorder. There is no eating disorder body. We do not know what's going on by looking at someone. We do not know someone's health by looking at them. We have to figure out what's going on. So what a, a disservice to BIPOC individuals when they're not even being asked for or screened or even thought potentially this could be going on. The same thing is for the LGBTQ population. Those individuals are usually under greater stress and greater stigma. And that greater stress and that greater stigma can be associated with eating disorders. Identifying in the LGBTQ community does not cause eating disorders, but we know the stress and the stigma and the biases that sometimes that population is dealing with can um, be correlated to eating disorder behaviors. So what can I do? Jenny, are there any questions I should stop and get to before I go on? What do we do? Yeah, I had, uh, I have one for now is the, is the weight set point the same as the BMI chart? No, no, it is not. We do not use the BMI chart here. There, um, there's a lot of I don't even know how to politely say it. We don't use BMI here. We don't believe it is the best science to use for individuals. It is not, it was not even supposed to be used for what it's being used for right now. It's a very old equation and it was based on uh, white men. And so we don't use that. So that is not what we mean. Your set point is when you are regularly eating and food is stabilized and your weight is kind of stable and you don't feel a lot of preoccupation with food and kind of things just feel easy and there's homeostasis and the kind of the GI is working. And for a kid, we look at the growth chart because we're really great when we're younger, usually at intuitive eating before kind of all the noise comes in. And so we're honoring our body when it's asking for food. We're stopping when we feel full. Um, there's no like psychological issues coming in with eating yet. And so our bodies are naturally just going along that growth chart, that growth curve on your percentile. And so for a kid two to 20, I'm going to look at that growth chart. And that's how I kind of assume this is where your body probably wants to be. That's, Good. It for, that's it for now. All right. So what can I do? So the biggest thing I ask of loved ones or caregivers or coaches and um, people who want to help with this issue is to educate yourself and be aware. And that's what everyone here is doing today. So that's amazing so that we can all have even more eyes on the early warning signs of some of this. And we're not dismissing people who maybe need some attention or need some help. I also ask that people make sure they know the risks and they've researched any diets or cleanses that they're recommending, especially to children, or even if you're just talking about it out loud to yourself, that's what we call in therapy is like modeling, right? Like what I'm doing and what I'm talking about, someone else is paying attention to those young ears are listening, right? So just make sure that you know any risks of those diets or those cleanses that maybe you're promoting or talking about in front of kids and that you can help them clear up inaccurate. The things they hear on TikTok, the last thing I heard was eating dirt is healthy for you. And like everyone was talking about how to get dirt and like what it does for you. Um, so make sure you can help them clear up any inaccurate information they might be hearing or be at sounding board of, hey, I heard this. What do you know about this? Yeah, let's look that up together. Let's see what we're, what we're looking at. And then if you cannot perpetuate any diet or wellness culture myths of um, the one I go back to is like, oh, it's normal to lose your period. Girls should lose their period if they're working hard enough in their sports. And that's just not true. Another big thing I ask for adults and anyone who's, you know, helping to raise young people is to remove labels of food, but also of bodies. So making sure we're not talking about good food and bad food, food is just food and there's no healthy or unhealthy food because you don't know what that person needs to be their healthy self. You don't know what kind of health they're looking for. I talk about mental health, physical health, spiritual health, social health, financial health, um, there are so many ways to be healthy and being in a small body does not equal health and being in a large body does not equal unhealthy. So we have to make sure we're helping to break those things that have become coupled. So not using words like healthy or unhealthy or junk and not commenting on like, oh, look at that woman who like bounced back after her pregnancy. Like she's so thin or she got her body back. All those things are being 
taken in by especially the kids around us as their brains are still forming, as they're trying to figure themselves out and figure out the world. And so just trying to be careful with what we're saying. Um, for parents, I ask that they advocate for their kids at their well child exams. Sometimes doctors will say things benign or they'll say things they're not meaning to do harm at all, but the way that it's interpreted to a child or to a family, um, or depending on the kind of the work maybe they've done outside or other specialists they've talked to, just to make sure that parents are advocating for those kids at those exams. And a lot of this work is examining our own personal biases. Many people grew up believing small bodies were better or a certain type of body were better or that a certain type of food is better. We put a lot of morality on these things or a certain type of athlete look is better for a sport, right? Or if you're this way, then this means you look better or you will do better. Or if you lose 10 pounds, you'll be better at this sport. And so we, especially as the adults have to examine a lot of that stuff in us. And where did I get that messaging from? Does that feel right to me still? Does this align with my values? Is, is this what I wanna pass on to the kids or the other people in my life? And then when you're having those conversations, like we talked about, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes ago, if you think something is going on, I ask that you stay curious and try to not be judgmental. So inquire, like, what's a normal day like? And this all depends on a relationship. If this is a really awkward question, if you don't know a kid and all of a sudden you're just like, hey, what's a typical day like? What kind of meals do you like? Like, that's not going to feel like normal. Um, but if you, depending on the relationship that you have with the person, like, what does a typical day look like? We call it a 24-hour recall. And you can tell a lot about a person with, you know, what their 24 hour recall looks like. And like, is that normal for you? Is that like, was that a larger day, a smaller day, a busier day? What kind of day was that? And what does it feel like? What does it feel like eating in the lunchroom? What does it feel like eating with the team? Do you like when we go out and get ice cream? Do you like when we like <laughs> go get Slurpees? What does it feel like to you? Is there anything that make it easier? Is it too loud for you? And just anything, what do you think about the TikTok trend of eating dirt? right? Like whatever it might be. What do you think about that? And just a curious without judgment. Whenever you're bringing a concern to someone, therapists will always talk about I statements. So instead of saying like, you're losing weight, you're skipping meals, you're sneaking food, you're hiding food to say like, I'm worried because I notice that there were some wrappers hidden and I'm worried that you feel like you have to hide that from me, or I'm worried that you might feel stressed around that. Or I noticed that you didn't really like dinner or you didn't really eat dinner yesterday. I'm just curious, like what's up, what's going on. And just kind of letting them know how you feel and giving them the opportunity to say what's going on. Um, like I said, discuss school lunches or what it's like social outings. Are they not going out with their friends because their friends are going to Jimmy John's and they don't want to eat at Jimmy John's or they don't know what to order there. And then ask who they're following <clears throat> on social media. It's a really fun therapy exercise to have someone open up their phone and look at who they follow, look at their for you page, look at what they've saved, look at the videos and the pictures that they've saved. And sometimes we have to do a social media cleanse. Social media is not like the end all be all of the most evil thing ever. Um, but it can help or it can hurt. And so what are you putting in your life? If you're on your phone seven hours a day, what is going into your brain seven hours a day? What kind of messaging? How can I help clear up the environment for you without judgment? Just like, hey, maybe this isn't helpful. So the eating disorder cycle is something that we have to interrupt when we're looking for help. And so do I need to step in and help with the dieting or the restriction or the compensatory behaviors that are happening that usually will lead to preoccupation with food or they're going to lead to a binge. And we just keep kind of going around this cycle. If I have a binge, am I going to feel guilt and shame? I'm going to feel like a failure, even though that binge was maybe because I had been not allowing myself a certain food or not allowing myself a lot of food for a good amount of time. And so I binged, but now I feel like a failure. I feel like that was my willpower. What's wrong with me? I was supposed to be doing this new diet. I can't even stick to it because your body's working against you because it's working for you. And then you have negative feelings or you have poor body image, maybe, or maybe someone says something about your body or about how you look or about how it's changed. And so you're like, okay, to help that I'm in a diet or I need to do a compensatory behavior. And we just kind of keep going in the cycle again and again. So therapy wise, I want to know where I can kind of get into this cycle or with ARFID, maybe there's food avoidance, low energy store. So I'm just like not getting enough to eat. 
And then now I'm only interested in what we call highly palatable food. So all I feel like is safe to eat is like Cheetos because a bag of Cheetos always tastes like a bag of Cheetos. Uh, strawberry doesn't always taste like a strawberry because are you getting a July strawberry? Are you getting a September strawberry? Are you getting a January strawberry? Like they, they can taste different, but Cheetos always taste like Cheetos and that feels safe to me. So that's all I eat. And then people label that food and they say, oh, that's junk food. That's all you're eating. And then you kind of feel bad around that food and you get tired of only eating Cheetos and then you're avoiding food and then you have low energy stores and we just kind of keep going in the circle. So we have to find a way to interrupt this. And a lot of adults will say, when I say we got to interrupt the cycle somewhere, right? We got to step in. They say, what if I make it worse? You don't make it worse because we have to call attention to this. And in eating disorder care, we have five different levels of care so that wherever the severity of the eating disorder is, wherever the support level is, whatever the support needed for that family is, there's a different level of care for this. So this is something when I meet with a family, I explain all the different levels of care. I explain how we know what's the appropriate level of care for what's going on. We're big on educating and empowering our clients and our families and making sure that they have all the information. So there are five different levels of care because no eating disorder is the same and no family needs the same care. Um, at my office, we do outpatient care and we do IOP. So that stands for intensive outpatient, but there are PHP levels of care. There's residential where you go and you stay somewhere for eight to 12 weeks. And some people need an inpatient level of care for eating disorders because they need that medical stability because a lot of medical issues do arise with eating disorders. So can they be prevented? No, but early and aggressive treatment is the best thing that we have right now. So again, recognizing risk factors, helping to deal with those risk factors. And then what we wanna do is increase protective factors. So protective factors, what we can do is the environment that we have, if you're talking about the athletes in your life and the kids in your life, how can we help make this a really helpful environment for them? So how can I make practice or games or school or after school activities a really great environment for them? So I'm already going to work on, I'm not going to comment on their food. I'm not going to comment on their body or other people's bodies in front of them, even if it's meant to be helpful or positive. We just don't comment on bodies because people are so much more interesting than what their bodies look like, right? There's so much more going on with all these super cool kids that are in your lives every day than what their bodies look like or what their bodies can do. And so we're going to watch our language around them. We're going to watch our comments around them. And we're going to remind them of what makes them them and why we love having their energy in our day or in our lives or what we love about hanging out with them and remind them a lot of athletes identify as an athlete. And that's a huge identity to them, which is wonderful if it becomes their only identity and then they have an injury or they're no longer able to participate in that sport, that can be really hard for them. So reminding them that, yes, you are a basketball player and that's amazing and you're so great and I love your passion. You're also really good at math and you're such a great big brother. And I love how curious you are and just like all these different things that I love about you. You are such a well-rounded, amazing person. And then watch whenever we're talking about health. That's another big thing. I kind of touched on that earlier. But when you say healthy, just ask yourself, does that mean skinny to me? Because for a lot of people, it does. And in my office, when they're like, I just want to be healthy, I just want to be healthy. Sometimes I'll say, if you mean skinny, can you just say skinny? Is that what we're talking about so that we know? Okay. Is healthy skinny to you? Or does health mean that you are a well-rounded person and you have self-care time and you feel like your money is in order and you like your job or your job's okay and you have friends that you hang out with and maybe you have a partner that you enjoy hanging out with and healthy to you means kind of like everything feels like pretty good to you. Or <clears throat> does healthy mean you can run a marathon and your cardiovascular health is amazing? And is that what healthy means to you? You get to define it however you want. Does healthy mean that you own your own house and you don't have any debt? Maybe that's healthy to you and that's fine. So watch what you mean about health because that might not be someone else's definition of health. And then always, always support, especially kids when they're coming to you. If they're coming to you and saying like a coach or a teacher or a counselor can be such a beautiful relationship for a kid at all ages, but high school, especially if they don't have that at home, or even if they do have that at home and you're spending so much time with them. And that can be such a helpful relationship if they feel that they can come to you and say, Hey, this is going on for me, or I think something's wrong. Can I talk to you about it? And just to be able to be there and listen to them and just let them talk without any judgment 
and just to be that person can be so helpful and validate like that must feel super scary or like you're totally safe here. I don't have to tell anyone we're talking about. What do you need to talk about? Or let's figure that out together. Or I got you. What do you need? I've got you. And then for us as the adults in their life, the more that we can model and normalize our own body respect in that eating is, you know, enjoyable to us. Or I talk about modeling a lot for parents with kids and being like, oh, I noticed I feel kind of full, but like that lasagna was super good. I think I want one more bite because like my mouth is hungry and my belly's not really hungry. And just kind of like making the inside talk, the outside talk because then kids are taking that in and then they're going to make that their inside talk. And we're giving kind of the vocabulary for that or of, Oh, I feel like this shirt is a little tight. I think I'm going to, maybe I'm going to get a more comfortable shirt. I'm going to get a size up because that feels more comfortable to me and not like being mean to our body or disrespectful to our body and just respect. You don't have to love your body. You can respect it and take care of it. Right. All right. So where can I find more resources? These are some books that I love. The last one is an athlete specific book, Running in Silence. I have not read it, but I've had clients who are runners who've read it and they like it. Um, it's about perfectionism and eating disorder as a, as a runner. And then there are all different types of books here. And I can share this presentation or share the screen if anyone wants this, because uh, I'm going to kind of click through. But there's books about when your child has an eating disorder, if you're working through an eating disorder, if you want to know the medical complications about eating disorder, if you want a workbook to work through, if you want to work on body image, there's lots of different book resources here that I love. And then these are some websites that I like. Uh, the first one is our website at our office. Feast, F-E-A-S-T, is a wonderful website that was made by parents of kids with eating disorders for parents of kids with eating disorders. There's lots of support. There's lots of stories of hope. There's lots of this is going on. What do I do? Here's what you do. We got you. There's lots of wonderful resources on that. And then just other eating disorder websites in general. And you don't have to have all the answers. I'm here to just kind of give you a broad overview as much as I can, hoping to get other eyes on kids, athletes, especially just to make sure that they're fueled and that they're getting enough. Um, but you don't have to have all the answers. If you say, hey, I think this might be a problem. I know a place you can go, right? Like parents can always come to me. You guys can come to me. If you need a consultation for something, please let me know. If you have questions for me, let me know. I don't expect you guys to be the experts on eating disorders, unless you're also an expert on eating disorders. Um, but there are places that you can go. So what I hope you take away today is that caregivers don't cause eating disorders. So that is one big myth we have to get out of here. They're not rare but they also all are very treatable. And the best thing we can do is early and aggressive intervention. So if you are seeing something, it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to ask about it in a non-judgmental way, staying curious. It's okay to um, talk to parents about it. The symptoms are known to be secretive. So if you find out there has been an eating disorder in your student or in your athlete, and it's been happening for eight months, it's been happening for the whole season, it's been happening since last year, and you didn't know that doesn't mean you didn't see it. That means that eating disorder was doing what eating disorders do, and it's trying to be really secretive. Remember, the first two to three years is what we consider catching it early because that's how secretive they they usually are in the beginning. They're complicated illnesses. There's not one cause. You're not going to say one thing to a kid and cause them to have an eating disorder. We cannot control all of the risk factors, but we can help to increase protective factors for the kids. And there is support available. There is help available. There's lots of support groups. There's lots of websites with information. There's lots of books. There's people to talk to. These are eating disorders are something that I feel like people don't talk about a lot. Um, if anyone's going to be a trunk or treat tomorrow, maybe I will see you there. I'll be there too. Super fun event for the district. And if you need anything from me, this is my office. This is me and my team out in the community. We like to go and speak and engage and I love to do presentations. So if you want me to talk to anyone at any time, please let me know. I love to kind of get the word out there. 